So I'm going to talk to you today about talking. And in particular, I'm going to talk about what we communicate when we speak via our voice and what that means for talking to machines. Most of what we communicate to each other, we do intentionally. We transfer information, we tell stories, we ask questions, we make requests of one another. And much of this information is communicated via the words we say. But there's a tremendous amount of other information that we communicate while we speak. And a lot of this is transmitted by what we commonly call tone of voice. So speech can be divided into two components. What is said, the words, or lexical content of speech, and how it's said, that we refer to as prosody. Prosody covers all of the production qualities of speech that aren't involved in saying a word. So this includes things like pitch and loudness, speaking rate and rhythm, voice quality effects like breathiness or harshness, and the use of pausing. <laughs> so I've been talking to you for about a minute or so. And I would argue that I've already communicated a great deal about myself via my voice. Even if you were just listening to this, you would have a reasonable guess if I'm male or female. You would also be able to sort of approximate what my age is, or at least determine that I'm not a child and I'm not elderly. But can you also tell that my native language is English or American English? Can you tell if I was born and raised in the South or the Northeast? Can you get as specific as New York City? You've probably already decided if you like me or not, also. <laughs> One way or the other. <laughs> so in addition to these sort of demographic and identity indicators that we communicate via our voice, we also communicate temporary qualities about our attitudes and opinions and things like emotion. So when I'm talking here, do I sound angry? Or do I sound joyful? Maybe I sound tired or sad? Do I seem nervous or confident? I hope I already sound a little bit knowledgeable. And when I say I'm very, very, extremely, truly, dramatically happy to be participating in this program today, do I sound sarcastic? <laughs> so we also sometimes communicate membership in social groups via our tone of voice and our pronunciation. So famously, in the 80s, the Valley Girl style of speech was characterized by uptalk, where at the end of every phrase, you have this rising pitch. <laughs> Today, vocal fry or creak is used to similar effect. So vocal fry is this quality where the pitch in your voice breaks down as you're speaking. Um, and this leads to utterances like, so, do you want to get some froyo? <laughs> that creak. <laughs> so all of these things are communicated by our prosody, in some cases, our pronunciation. But you might reasonably make an argument that they're not fundamental to understanding what I'm saying. So let me look at a more basic problem. Asking a question. In English, we can take any statement and turn it into a yes-no question by raising our pitch at the end of the sentence, by a simple prosodic modification. So that means I can take the statement, Andrew gave a TED Talk, and have it become Andrew gave a TED Talk by a simple prosodic change. In addition to distinguishing questions from statements, we also use emphasis to indicate exactly what I'm, being ask, what I'm asking about and a number of assumptions about what's shared information between speaker and listener. So in the example here, Andrew gave a TED Talk. The question is asking about the status of the speaker, and maybe there's some understanding that this event is going on. If I emphasize gave, as in Andrew gave a TED Talk, the assumption is we know about me, we know about this event, but my status at it might be in question. I'm giving a talk or I'm listening. Or maybe it's an issue of tense. I gave a talk or am giving a talk. Finally, I can emphasize the last bit. Andrew gave a TED Talk, and this communicates that we know that I'm giving some sort of talk, but maybe it's a lecture, maybe it's specifically a TED Talk. So in this way, Changes in emphasis are communicating significant parts of information about this question. And to drive this point home a little bit more, let's look at what happens when prosody gets out of whack between question and response. Going back to the first incredulous question, Andrew gave a TED Talk, a reasonable response would be, no, Jason gave a TED Talk. 
But what if the respondent came back differently? Andrew gave a TED talk? No, Jason gave a TED talk. Well, this indicates that the respondent somehow believed that we were already talking about Jason, but his status at this event was in question. This leads the questioner to have a pretty firm belief that the respondent really didn't understand what was being asked about, right? Andrew gave a TED talk? No, Jason gave a TED talk. The words are exactly the same, the prosody doesn't match, so communication totally breaks down. So coming back to the sort of central idea of this talk, of what we communicate, by our tone of voice and our prosody, we communicate a tremendous amount of information about who we are, our attitudes and opinions and beliefs, and also specifically how information should be interpreted while we're speaking. When we learn a native language, we learn its prosody almost automatically. In fact, some people argue that you learn prosody of a language first and the words and syntax follow. There are about 300 million native speakers of English, but an additional 500 million to 2 billion non-native speakers. Miscommunication is much more likely to occur due to errors in prosody and emphasis than they are in pronunciation. So just as an example, if someone were to say Andrew instead of Andrew, I would reasonably be able to understand what they're saying, in part because there's not too many choices of what they may have meant by Andrew. But a misplaced emphasis on the wrong word, or inadvertently sounding angry, or aggressive, or rude, or timid, can be really difficult to recover from when, when communicating with somebody who may not be a native speaker. And language instruction rarely includes instruction in the prosody of the language you're learning. So let me just share an example. I had a friend who's Argentine. He was living in New York at the time. And by the book, totally fluent. Wrote great papers, got them published, easy conversationalist, gave really good lectures. But he found himself in some sort of conflict with his landlord. Something about a mysterious odor, or a smell, or vermin in his apartment. And he comes in to the lab where we're working, incredibly frustrated, and he's like, man, if only I could speak to this guy in Spanish, he would understand how angry I actually am. So he's able to really communicate well in English, except when it comes down to this transmission of emotion. And learning native-like prosody of a language is incredibly difficult, and I'm not trying to undermine that, but it's made harder because we don't take this information and this mode of communication as critical to the language itself. All that said, I'm a computer scientist, and I work in speech, and so that means talking to machines, and particularly machines that talk back to you. Um, and it's a really good time to work in this field for a couple of reasons. The first is uh, this. We've convinced millions of people to put reasonably high-powered computers into their pockets, attach incredibly high-powerful microphones to them, and speak right into them. Okay? Second, major technology companies have launched a bunch of exciting speech products. There is uh, Apple's Siri, Google Voice Input, Amazon's Echo System. But the question is, where is this demand coming from? I think it's sort of twofold. First, we like these devices to be small. And small devices have small screens and smaller keyboards. So typing and a visual response as an input modality really doesn't work anymore. And speech is a perfect candidate for an alternative, because we all know how to speak and hear, for the most part. Second, talking to machines is cool, right? Talking to your phone is cool. Talking to your watch is cool. Uh, talking to your talking car is going to be cool within the next couple of years. Google thought talking to your glasses was going to be cool. Maybe they were wrong, but... Mm. So when you think about speech produced by a machine, what comes to mind? I would guess that even though some of these products have really sort of started to make headway in this direction, people still think synthesized speech sounds kind of like this. I am a talking machine. Please talk to me incredibly stiff, metallic, and particularly monotone. But in fact, in 2015, synthesized speech sounds and a lot more like this. And I help doctors identify cancer treatments. Is that all? I've recently learned Japanese. Yeah, I was being sarcastic. I haven't learned sarcasm yet. Hey Siri, read me my unread emails. 
Princess have sent you an email about life-changing opportunity if you please. It says, I have a once-in-a-lifetime investment opportunity for the making of many of millions of currency. Alexa, how tall is Mount Everest? Mount Everest's height is 29,029 feet, 8,848 meters. How can it know so much? It's so small. Okay, so it's not perfect, but speech synthesis right now is really taking prosodic information into account to get the rhythm and tone of speech more or less human-like and certainly quite a bit better than it was, say, 20 years ago. And in part, this comes from a couple of directions. Text analysis is used to decide what words should be emphasized and where phrase boundaries should occur, and techniques called prosodic assignment are used to assign specific pitch values to each of the speech sounds that are produced. And, you know, progress is being made. When it comes to speech recognition, we can do a number of things with our phones and other devices right now. We can uh, make a Google query, we can dictate an email or a text message, but few, if any, speech applications have any sort of prosodic component at all. So let's look at, again, one of these more fundamental questions. Um, how, do we ask in, how do we ask a question? If I want to dictate this into a text message on an iPhone, I have to say, hey, comma, Chinese tonight, question mark. This strikes me as totally baffling, right? The underlying speech recognition technology here is incredibly sophisticated, and yet, it can't understand if I'm asking a question or saying like, hey, Chinese tonight. Um, so what I want to bring our attention to is like, how does this actually happen? How do we find ourselves in a situation where we can recognize hundreds of thousands of words, but not how they're being spoken? And the issue is this. We've, in the field, defined the speech recognition problem as this, transcriptions of words, as just a running sequence of tokens, undifferentiated by intonation and unseparated by punctuation. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that in 2015, the machines are sounding relatively human-like, but we sound like this. I am a talking person. Please listen to me. We sound incredibly robotic and stiff, in part because these machines have no access to how we're producing speech. So in my lab, we're working on developing and improving representations of prosodic information for consumption by these machines. This involves long-range analysis, which are used to uh, identify different demographic qualities in a speaker, more utterance-by-utterance -utterance analyses to recognize uh, things like emotion and whether or not a person's asking a question, and then shorter-term analyses to determine which words are emphasized and where phrase boundaries occur. And in the last few years, we've seen some interesting progress in being able to recognize artifacts of Parkinson's disease in, in people's speech, recognizing specific emotions when they talk, and assessing the nativeness of language learners. But to be clear, there's still a long way to go in this direction. So I'd like to bring our attention now to an even simpler problem, which is possibly even more profound. So, I told you earlier that we defined and have defined speech recognition as a word-for-word -word transcription problem. Using this as a target, right, and defining performance measures against this, we've seen tremendous improvements over the last 25 years, and I think even an order of magnitude improvement over the last five years, okay? So here's my proposition. Take punctuation seriously. This should be a correct transcription of speech. We should require our speech recognition technology to recognize periods, question marks, commas, and parentheses with the same accuracy at which we recognize words. And why is this important? Well, here's the big secret. Punctuation is prosody. It's not being used, for the most part, to indicate what the word is, but it is used to indicate how the word should be interpreted and what the intended meaning actually is. There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of incredibly intelligent, sometimes brilliant, and very creative researchers working on speech recognition. I don't think we can't do this because it's impossible, but just because we haven't acknowledged that it's a problem and we're not measuring performance against it. We communicate a tremendous amount of information via how we speak, the prosody, and our tone of voice. For people, this has important implications for what fluency really looks like. For talking to machines, 
We've come a long way in making our machines sound more human and more native-like. When it comes to speech recognition, we're doing a tremendous job in recognizing what is said, but we're still really lagging behind when it comes to recognizing how it's said. But I'm confident this problem can be solved, and as soon as we start making progress on it, we'll be that much closer to delivering on the promise of natural, easy, human-like communication with our machines. Thank you very much.